You're listening to Science and Saucery, a show dedicated to adding life to your years. And now your hosts, registered dietitian Juliana Hever and scientist Ray Cronice. Welcome. Hello, hello. How are you doing today? I'm great, Raymond James. How are you doing? I am doing well, Juliana. Well, good. <laughs> because just yesterday, I got to go out on the back patio and play in the dirt. And you were so happy gallivanting out there, making us some beautiful greens and planting some yes. deliciousness that's coming. I'm so excited. So it's exciting with today's show because every year for the last, I don't know, three or four years, I have posted photographs of my hydroponic system here. And I say my hydroponic system only because it resides here. Uh, some friends <laughs> of mine now I've known since 2011, 2012. Mike and Mark, they designed and patented this incredible hydroponic system. And, and what's really amazing, and I hope we can get into some of this today and talking to Mark, who's going to be our guest today, uh, I hope that we can get into just how many rules they broke along the way. So I like them because they they were a little bit rebellious mm -hmm. in their in their design approach. They, yes. You know, people would say, this can't be done. Right, but those are always the best inventions, yeah, you it's, know? Yeah, it's really great. And the system has been so easy and effortless to use. And so anyway, I, I texted Mark because I was getting ready to post some pictures and talking about this, and every year I know it, there's this deluge, and I was looking for their website, and I couldn't find their website because I knew I had to have that before I posted. And, you know, they had moved on. You know, Mike had a, a baby and, and hopefully we'll talk about this. Mike had a baby and, and Mark had moved up to the Bay Area. And so they really weren't doing the vertical earth garden as it's called. They weren't doing that regularly. So I talked Mark into putting up a site so that we actually have a site. He has a new site up there for the plans, et cetera. And so anyway, we're going to have Mark on today, and it is going to be a lot of fun. So, And I just want to say this. Like, this is the most timely time to take this into consideration. Like, you, you know, everyone out there may be kind of struggling with trying to find the right foods at the store and everything, but what about putting it right in your own home? Like, like you can do this yourself. And they make it so user-friendly. It's just amazing. Plant preppers. Plant preppers. <laughs> That's it. We're plant preppers. Yeah, so... This is really a lot of fun, and I'm going to bring on Mark here in a minute, but I know that this is going to probably go into a long conversation because Mark and I have been talking for years, and we both get so excited about this. So I'm going to sit back and listen, really. <laughs> well, no, you— And you, learn. Listen hey, and look, learn. this has been good. You had a really good luck with your first time, so you did You did okay with having never done growth, I did, growth stuff ex before. I did, except—well, I had tried. I'd had really failed attempts beforehand, but this was the best attempt except that— where I live, it happened to be the first time we planted happened to be the biggest um, heat. Like, what's it called? Like heat a, um, a heat wave. It was like this crazy heat wave, like right. 120 degrees, <laughs> like never before seen heat right directed at my balcony. So it lasted for a little while, but um, I need to start again. <laughs> right. So let's bring in Mark today, um, Mark DeMitchell, and he is one of the co-inventors of the Vertical Earth Garden. So welcome, Mark. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, it's been a lot of fun over the last couple of years since we originally met. And I, I, I think I hunted you down at some point because I was so enamored with the design you guys, you and Mike, created. And I've watched the veg go through a lot of different permutations over the year. But more importantly, uh, you know, it's kind of like the uh, hair club for men. I'm not just a someone promoting this. I'm, I'm a client. I've, I've owned one and it's been very, very successful uh, in using it. But uh, I want to share a little background story with everybody. Maybe tell a, little, a few people how you got into hydroponics, because I know it's not what you're doing full time. Maybe tell them a little bit about what you do full time as well, but also how you got involved in hy hydroponics in the beginning and 
you know, take some of those twisty roads through that so that we can catch everybody up. And then we'll talk about veg because everybody uh, seems to be coming out of the woodwork this time of the year asking me about how to do this. And I think it's this is a perfect time to do it. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me on. I'll try to make the backstory as concise as possible because, uh, yeah, it started started a while ago. I'm, I'm 33 right now. And I probably started in my mid-20s uh, when I first kind of got involved with uh, wanting to grow veggies. So it, it actually didn't start with hydroponics. We That was actually just uh, a, a means to an end. Uh, it, it really started with uh, my business partner, uh, Mike. Uh, Mike and I, we grew up in San Diego. Uh, tons of track homes. If you've ever been to San Diego, uh, you'll be very familiar yes. with Southern California track homes. So big stucco walls uh, on four bedroom homes. Tons of white stucco, right? Um, so I came back from college, was tutoring, graduated into the great recession in 2008. So had a lot of time back, back at my childhood home and, um, yeah, was, was involved with, uh, with growing vegetables and sustainability in college with some of my roommates. And, uh, I said, wow, these are a ton of blank white walls that just get beat down, uh, by the sun all day in Southern California. It'd be great if these were actually practical and you could use them. So I was thinking, man, it would, you know, a lot of people down here in Southern California are into organic food was just becoming a, a really popular trend. You know, it'd be great if people could grow on their walls and not just have the sun beating down on them. So that was kind of the the, um, the inspiration or the origin point. And uh, with Mike, um, he he had a landscape construction background and his dad was uh, our dad had owned this landscape construction business. Um, he helped me kind of bring the initial zigzag idea on a piece of paper, uh, to life. And, uh, you know, one weekend he finally said, let's go build this over at my dad's landscape construction yard. So, um, we, we knew nothing about what we were doing and, um, yeah, uh, hydroponics was just, uh, uh, added into that when we realized, Hey, this thing's got to be light. We can't pack it full of soil, uh, cause it's vertical. It's going to get real heavy. So that's when we realized, uh, or when we started to investigate hydroponics. Yeah, that makes sense. So really there's this passion for growing things. There's this, you know, you're, you, you love design in general. And obviously Mike, who I, who I also know, mm -hmm. Mike had this sort of you know, the background with, with, with plants and with getting things started. And so what was that first, you know, 1.0 version uh, like? What were some of the issues that you ran up against? And then we'll, we'll get into hydroponics more in more detail in a minute, but what, what, what was it like uh, creating that first unit? Yeah, our first one, uh, we still have the pipes from it uh, down in San Diego. Uh, Mike has them still. Uh, we It was so crappy. I think it, uh, it ran for maybe a week before it fell apart, but we were excited uh, that water was pumping through it and returning, and, and we were growing some snap peas from starter plants. And it was, it was a mess, but we were so excited. It looked terrible. It was like a plumber's tape, which is metal. Like imagine metal tape with a bunch of holes in it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, it looked like a Mad Max garden and was leaking everywhere. And uh, but we were excited. <laughs> I think uh, you know when we saw that the plant survived a twenty-four hour period. <laughs> uh, I think that's when we Success. were like, okay, yes, this yeah, could work. Yeah, we're gonna figure this out. <laughs> And how did it evolve after that? Yeah, I think, you know, we were we were excited that the plant survived uh, until the garden kind of collapsed um, because we were using plumber's tape and uh, some some other just, you know, kind of learning on the fly. Um, but the fact that the plant survived was was super inspirational and really exciting. So. Uh, yeah, we just started working on, okay, let's make sure this thing doesn't collapse in a week and doesn't leak everywhere. And then after we figured that out, um, you know, we said, okay, great. You know, this still looks like a Mad Max garden, you know, maybe we can paint it. Maybe we can use some nicer wood. 
um, you know, uh, what would what would get our one of our parents in our track homes to say, hey, make me a small one and I'll actually put it on the side of my house. So we got it to that point. It probably took, I don't know, maybe maybe 10 different iterations. And uh, yeah, we ended up just going big for our first ones. I mean, really, really big, like uh, 10 feet tall by uh, 10 feet long. So wow. it was... Right. We shot for the moon immediately. Yeah. And and let me point out to the audience, because a lot of them won't be able to visualize this, but one of the things that was really common uh, with hydroponic systems then, and by the way, I went back to our first emails, they were around February 2012. So end of, end of uh, 2011, uh, beginning of 2012 is when you and I started talking about this. And we'll talk about the patent. When was your patent issue? that you did oh man i it's it's been a while so i can't remember mid 2014 what's really interesting is all these hydroponic systems that you see commercially almost all of them are sort of a think about a barrel shape they're kind of vertical and they're a barrel shape and they have plants around the perimeter and I, what i think is so really amazing about this story is that uh, mark and mike ended up designing something that that serpentines around. And this is going to be critical. It was critical to their ornamental design patent they have on this. It was also critical to the function because when you have a barreled shaped system and you've got a sun that's tracking over, you know, if it's if you've got stuff sitting out linearly in a field or in a flat plane, the sun just goes from one angle and then it passes over to the other angle to the you know setting sun. And there's just sort of light. Maybe there's a tree that shades it or something. When you ta now take those same plants and wrap them around a cylinder or a barrel, you create a completely different situation because, well, first of all, the, the plants at the top start shading the plants at the bottom, kind of like the rainforest trees and the, and the underbrush in a, in a forest. But the other problem is that plants on the back side of the barrel relative to the sun or on the front side get different amounts of morning and day light the ones on the north side versus the south side, let's just say it was oriented perfectly with the axis, get different. And so it's really not optimal because you get this wide diversity of growing. And so, you know, putting one of these on a rotisserie table, you know, was when we, Mark and I were talking about this a long time ago about other kind of creative ideas, like you could probably slow bake this and put it on a, ta on a rotisserie table. But really and truthfully, what they were able to do is by serpentining this pipe around, the plants, there is a front and a back in some sense, and plants can shade a little bit. But what it allows you to orient it and do is really the plants at the very top rung get to grow just as high as they can. And even the next ones just sort of bush out, but you end up with a much more efficient use of plants. And what I'm actually hearing for the first time, because you haven't really told me that backstory, is that configuration actually is a result of trying to use a big, large wall when you don't have a lot of horizontal footprint to put a garden. Is, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think I think we kind of got fortunate and stumbled into that design uh, or the benefits of it for mm -hmm. plant growth um, was kind of a, a secondary a big benefit um, of of going vertical and using as, you know, as little material as possible. Um, but yeah, I mean, compared to the cylinder, like buoy, kind of like ocean buoy looking gardens that are out there. I mean, you're exactly right. The, the plants get so much more room to grow in all directions, not just out. Right. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of different ways to like, uh, support the plants off of, off of our garden design that have been really creative uh, that we've seen right. people do. From that point, you guys moved then. You came up with some pretty innovative tries at, you know, entrepreneurials. Obviously, we're trying everything. You're a crackpot till the, you hit the jackpot, right? But when we first started talking, you had deployed a bunch of these gardens on the roofs or on the balconies at nice restaurants in the San Diego area. And you and Mike were servicing the plants. Tell, tell us a little bit about that business, but more importantly, how that changed the dynamic of, of say, local fresh. Like you guys really created almost a, a new category. Yeah, yeah. I think um, that being kind of like blissfully ignorant about, about business and startups and, and trying to do your own thing, 
uh, there, the silver lining was that we weren't afraid to try out a bunch of different things and move quickly. Um, I'd say the downside is, you know, we also didn't understand uh, a lot of the business elements that went into starting your own, uh, your own startup. Um, but yeah, one of the, the silver lining pieces, uh, we weren't afraid to say no. And, um, we actually had, uh, had one of our gardens, you know, we were like, okay, you know, let's, let's see if other people like these after we got one that we felt comfortable with. And, uh, we, we had it at a farmer's market in San Diego and actually had, uh, uh, a chef stop by one of the executive chefs in the area, uh, on our first week. And he said, wow, this is really cool. Can you grow X, Y, and Z? And we said, yeah, we can grow a ton of it. <laughs> and he said, oh, you know, can you come over to my restaurant and check out the space? Let's describe for the audience what this original um, veg and what obviously it's close to what we have today. Let's describe visually for them what this thing looks like, you know, how many plants, what the yeah. width, light, width and height. Let's just describe that for a second. Yeah. So if you can imagine kind of like uh, just two uh, two wood posts. Uh, that are parallel to each other. So imagine a wall and then two wood posts, maybe five or six feet apart from each other. And then now imagine uh, a pipe starting at one of the posts and then going diagonal down to the other post. And then it, it goes back to the other pipe and then back to the other pipe and then back one more time. Uh, so it wraps around is what it's doing. So it's yeah. on, like you said, it's serpentine, sloping right? down. It's serpentine, serpentine is the best word. I did a yes. terrible job right there of describing it. But. <laughs> no, no, you did good. You did good. So, and then on each of these runs, on these larger systems that you built, about how many plants would you? So let's just say that this was about you know six or eight feet wide and two feet or long and then two feet wide. And then how tall was it? Yeah. Some of the early ones for restaurants were 10 feet tall by 10 feet long, and then about uh, a foot and a half deep. So some of those were uh, over 50 plants per garden. And wow. some of the restaurants had four of them, uh, some of them five. Right. So we're talking about a lot of planting space because the packing of these was really good. And with 50 plants, I mean, you got 50 kale plants. This is a lot of kale because it grows like weeds and in the these herbs, systems, herbs right? Herbs, etc. And that seems like a mammoth thing, but on the ground, its footprint was two feet by 10 feet. You know, the vertical space, back to the name, Vertical Earth Garden, the vertical space is free space. You know, think about the limits that we have in farming. Are you the limits you have in your backyard of putting a garden in? You have to have square footage. You've got to, you know, you have to now work all that soil. And, you know, here in Alabama, everything's clay, you know. And, and I think, yeah. in, you know, obviously you go to a place like Nevada where everything is, is sand, you know, or, or even in Southern California. So this idea of being able to have perfectly fertile growing conditions. And we'll talk about how hydroponics works in a minute. But in a place that's just two feet by 10 feet, by even 10 feet tall, that's obviously big. You need a ladder to reach the top. But the thing here is, is that you can grow a lot of vegetables in something like that. Yeah, I think one of the coolest uh, installations we did was at a place called Coronado Brewing. Um, they're a big brewery now. Um, you guys might have had, some of the listeners might have had their beer, um, but they also had a restaurant uh, down in San Diego. And we initially put four or five of our vertical gardens on their roof in the matter of a couple hours. Uh, we just hoisted them up on a forklift and they were growing close to 200 uh, Italian basil plants, um, to use in their kitchen. Uh, we ended up growing so much basil, uh, one of the seasons that they, uh, ended up making a, a limited production, uh, beer using the basil <laughs> and ended up selling out of the beer almost immediately. Basil beer. Um, so yeah, the, the basil was literally growing on top of the brewery. Uh, so it was like the freshest, most local, most organic, basil you can possibly get they grew it and then brew it or brewed it right underneath the roof uh, of where it grew so it was that that was a really cool project yeah and so you know this this becomes you know now people are starting to visualize this more that even with a restaurant now they there were there were other places growing other things they were using what what were some of the vegetables that and some of the things that were being grown successfully that restaurants were using in their everyday menu 
Yeah, I think a big one was uh, the heirloom tomatoes were always a big hit. Um, you know, and we we probably planted up to 40 or 50 varieties of heirloom tomatoes over the course of a couple of years for different chefs. Um, so that was a big one. And then all the herbs were really big. So parsley, tarragon, uh, oregano, cilantro, um, uh, oh, all the mint types. Uh, right. Some of the chefs really wanted like uh, chocolate, chocolate mint. mint. Oh, I love chocolate, chocolate mint. mint. I, I almost picked it up the other day oh, when I was I planting mine. You I didn't, didn't get, get any? No, oh. but I can go back and get some. So but good. yeah, chocolate mint. So I've and grown that, that, that once year. Yeah, that one was wild because it was, uh, you know, hard for them to find on a regular basis, get a regular supply of it, and they paid a lot for it. And it grows like a weed in our system. Right. So we were growing hundreds of dollars of specialty mint for these, uh, for these restaurants on site. And at that time, the business model was basically you and Mike were servicing the unit. You were changing out plants. You know, one of the real advantages to this design is that you could just swap plants at any time. You you guys could, you could, you know, if a plant was overgrowing in one location or the sun or something, you could just pull, pick it up and then plop that in another hole where it was growing better. So you, like, you had this ability to really rotate plants in and out effortlessly like you know digging to do this is just a a, tra a trauma for the plant to transplant it and yet you could literally have something growing in a veg at your shop and you could pick it out keep the root structure intact bring it stick it in there and it's as if it didn't even know it had changed locations yeah exactly we were bringing in uh anytime we needed new plants or a chef needed new plants we just bring them in these totes uh, we'd grow them off site or get them started. And then, uh, yeah, we just bring them, put them in, uh, to their new home, take out the old ones. Uh, yeah, it, it was pretty seamless. Sometimes it would take 15 minutes to do. And then, you know, we'd make sure everything was working and, and come back in a week. Yeah, it's, it's really great. And I, and having done this a lot in my own backyard, uh, and on the, the balcony at Juliana's, in, in California, it's really incredible that you can have a full garden with a lot less effort. You know, there's no weeding because there's no place for the weeds to grow. Um, in terms of insects, it's relatively easy to control them manually. That's how I've always done it. But if somebody wanted to put something on there, they could do either an organic or do some other thing to, you know, soap or some insecticidal soap. But anyway, any of the problems in terms of insects or pests that you might have, and we'll talk about the the hardiness of these plants too, but you have this added benefit that, you know, if suddenly a kale breaks out with something, you can decide, to, okay, I'll just rip this plant out and I'll put another plant in and just take all of, all of that stuff along with it, you know? So it's really kind of an ingenious design from that perspective. But the point here is, is it's very serviceable and where the owner really just comes out with a pair of scissors or a bowl in terms of the tomatoes and fruit and just harvests ready to eat food. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the big benefit for a homeowner um, is it, it, it's just such or so much less maintenance. Yes. Very um, user friendly, you know, even for those with the black thumbs like me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A great I way think, to get this hyper local produce and not have to worry about like all that stuff, all that knowledge and skill set to be able to be effective in, in doing this in a typical way. Yeah. So eventually you scaled this down to the smaller, what did you call, what do you call, what was the smaller one called? Uh, it was called a veg hub. hub That's what yeah. we ended up calling it. And um, it, it's like 15 or 19 plants or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's about, I, I want to say it's 16, somewhere, somewhere in there, 15 or 16. Yeah. So, so you guys did this and the idea there was at one time you were selling completed units and, and shipping them out. Yeah, we were. So, yeah, I think it's one of those kind of blissful ignorance. You know, once we put them in restaurants, obviously people that are eating there are going to start calling you <laughs> and saying, hey, I want that at my house. And we're like, oh, cool. This is pretty neat. And then uh, so, yeah, we we kind of made this cookie cutter smaller one that we could, you know, we could kind of produce at Mike's dad's landscape construction yard. You know, at one point we had a makeshift assembly line going on and had a couple hundred of them That's um, crazy. that we could deploy to, to homeowners in San Diego. And, uh, 
So we you were going to expand the business model to not just be for restaurants and servicing them, but to do it and to be able to supply plants to, um, to homeowners. Yeah. Yeah. I think at that point we were just getting so many requests from homeowners that that became our main focus. Um, and it was cool, uh, when we were doing it, uh, down in San Diego, kind of the full service model was every season we deliver the new, new starter plants, uh, to people and, and they could just plop them in their garden. Um, you know, literally just pull the old ones out, put the new ones in and, you know, be done with it in 15 minutes and they'd have all the new season of plants. Yeah, that's, that's really amazing. So let's, let's shift a little bit with that background, sure. just of how you have stumbled into this and talk a little bit now more of what hydroponics really is. And, and I'm going to open up here with one part of it and then maybe set the table or foundation for you sort of to dig in because you obviously have been, um, uh, you know, promoting and selling hydroponics for a long time. And there's a lot of elements there. But one of the things I want people to fundamentally understand is that, you know, right now when we think about some of the competitive ways or we think about growing our own vegetables, you know, we'll get things like a permaculture or an aquaculture. And the idea is that, you know, you have these animals that are doing this and then you take the waste from the animals and then you put it on the plants and then you grow the plants. But this idea that the plants are basically extracting mineral and nitrogen content from the soil, phosphorus, et cetera, they're doing that. And then they're taking the carbon dioxide out of the air with the photosynthesis of, uh, with the help of photosynthesis, turning all this into the complex biomolecules that you guys always hear Julian and I rave about, the phytonutrition. So plants take inorganic materials which we would have tra traditionally called salts and they turn them into organic materials now we're not talking about organic food i'm talking about the real organic <laughs> chemistry which is the chemistry of carbon these really complex molecules like you know vitamin c so for example the one where do you get your protein a plant has to make all the amino acids and plants have the same 20 amino acids that we do. Their proteins are made out of the synthesized out of those. So they have to have all of them. All animals have to, none of them make all 20 of them. And so you either eat the plant or eat the animal that ate the plant, but the amino acids have been concentrated up. And why I'm saying that is because I want you to conceptually start with a foundation that essentially all of these minerals are really could be thought of as salt water. Now, I'm not talking about ocean water, and I'm not talking about high concentrations of, of salt. I'm just saying all these minerals are mineral salts that you dissolve in water, and so you have this tub of nutrients that has way more than the plant can use. And the only thing that's touching uh, this water that's being delivered, and Mark will talk more about this, are these plants and those roots are actually only taking up what they need. You can't obviously put them too concentrated or you can kill the plant, but at that right sweet spot of level, and they're very tolerant, the plant just takes up what it needs. And what this really means is, in some sense, this water reservoir is what this planter is for you. Just-in-time kale factory. When you need kale, you just go out and you grab it. And the same thing goes for the nutrients, the phosphorus, the potassium, and then all the trace minerals, copper and zinc, and all those trace minerals. It's right there in that water stream coming by the roots. And when the plant needs it, because it's just hit the right sunny day, or it's just hit the right temperature, and it's just ready for a growth spurt, suddenly that plant has all the nutrition it needs. It never runs out. Whereas... When we do it traditionally in soil, we throw manure or other kinds of organic material on the soil. That then needs to be broken down into the individual mineral content by bacteria. And it does happen. Mycelium, fungus in the soil, all those things break that down. And then the plant's root needs to kind of hunt around in the dirt and find that place. And it may or may not have everything. Not only that, every time it rains, all those concentrations around that plant change. And so as the plant grows, it can deplete the soil. We've heard people talk about depleted soils. It, I think it's overblown in some sense, but it is true that, that these plants need it. So hydroponics, for a lot of people, looks like a mystical, unnatural, 
chemical process, right? Chemical, yeah. right? It doesn't feel rich and organic. I'm, t- I'm, I'm, you know, making my own compost. I'm doing it natural. This is a real fallacy. And so, with that foundation, can you talk, Mark, a little bit about hydroponics in general, water usage, and and the growth rates and and all the wide range of things because you talked about tomatoes. I've never grown tomatoes in my veg. I've grown in, in 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 the other system. We'll talk about a deep water system in a minute. But can you talk a little bit about hydroponics in terms of what you've learned over these last you know fifteen or so years? What you've seen over and over again. I mean, you talked about being easy, but talk a little bit about the utilization. The, the maintenance, what a maintenance looks like over a week, and then also what you can grow and how fast it grows. Yeah, yeah. So that was a really, really good breakdown of the difference between hydroponics and traditional, you know, soil growing and, and uh, what's happening in, in both of those systems. So, uh, yeah, I think with uh, hydroponics, right, I'll go back to we didn't start with hydroponics. We actually it was more of a, a means to an end, um, but we got all of these secondary benefits from it. We initially used it because we didn't want soil because of the weight, because these are vertical, right? Mm-hmm. And and the maintenance of, of getting up high uh, and, and digging in soil when you're, you know, six feet up didn't seem practical to us. So we said, hey, you know, if we eliminate the soil, what are our options? And then so we looked at hydroponics um, and, you know, really educated ourselves at local hydroponic stores. And, um, when we told them, yeah, we're actually growing veggies hydroponically, or that's our interest. Um, they said, yeah, right. Yeah. They said, yeah, right. And then they, <laughs> they, sure. You you're know, growing vegetables. Everybody told us, they're like, oh, it's not going to taste as good as soil. Oh, oh yeah. it's not going to wow. taste as good. And that was just... Let's face it. They all thought you were really in pot on the side, yeah. you know, because yeah. you were two guys in San- Southern California. California <laughs> right? And, we're like, and let's no, face we- it, if it weren't for the pot growers, really and truthfully, in the last 20 or 30 years, even underground, these guys mastered hydroponics and really oh, yeah. <laughs> made stuff a lot less expensive, right? I mean, I'm not oh, exaggerating. 100%. when it, Those guys really took it to a whole new level because they were forced, because of laws, to grow things with artificial light in cl- confined spaces. And what's the most efficient? You don't want to bring a bunch of dirt like you're trying to be on uh, close encounters, you know, and build the uh, devil's tower in your living room, right? So, you know, yeah. you, you really want to try to do this in with a with a, a less footprint. And they were really the people that made hydroponics explode. Is that not is that not true? Definitely. Definitely in like the last 20 to 30 years. I mean, the, the science and technology that's come out of, uh, you know, those hobbyist growers, uh, you know, definitely spawned uh, an entire industry and especially yeah. here in, in, in the States and California. Um, but, but going back to, to taste, you know, that was something that we heard echoed from everybody um, in the hydroponic space. And we said, well, do you grow veggies hydroponically? And they all said no. And we're like, okay, so you just, you know, you're really just hearing that it doesn't taste as good and kind of echoing it. And, and we actually went out and did it. Mm-hmm. And we experimented with a ton of different nutrients um, and, and really, you know, did it ourselves instead of just taking, you know, what people were saying and not actually trying it themselves. And yeah, I mean, we, (laughs) we've grown the best tomatoes I've ever had in my entire life. Like at at a certain point, Mike and I were, uh, were so uh, such big believers in it that we, you know, we regularly told people, you know, we'll do a taste test of any of our veggies versus any of your organic soil veggies like we were that confident, you know, we would tell anybody in San Diego and that it's a big growing community in San Diego. People love growing veggies, but, um, yeah, we, we were that confident. And I I think the proof was that we had some of the best executive chefs in San Diego, uh, using our gardens. So that, so that says a lot, if they were that confident to, uh, to use our systems versus, you know, a soil raised bed and, you know, pick, pick off, uh, herbs and veggies and put it directly on somebody's plate in you know, 10 minutes. Uh, I think that was the, 
that was the big tell for us was yeah. actually doing it ourselves. Um, so yeah, I went off on a tangent, but that was a, a big misconception. Well, no, but it was a good tangent and I'll add to your tangent because I'll say when you look at other, uh, systems, one of the advantage against, and by the way, if you want to see this visually and you're sitting there, if you just put vertical earth garden in uh, Google, you'll see a lot of the, the serpentine, you'll see it, it zigzags back and forth. That's theirs. Now there's some alternatives that you'll see too. But here's another interesting point. Remember when we were talking earlier, I said something about the fact that the roots have the right amount of moisture. And so the vertical earth garden would be sort of classified as a thin film hydroponic because there's just a small trickle of water going down and it's passing all the plants. And then it cascades down automatically with gravity. You pump the water up to the highest point and then it just spills right back into the reservoir. And the nice thing about this is that none of the root systems are actually sitting, drowning in water, unless you have too much flow rate. You can actually put too much water in it and do that. And why this is important is that when roots just sit in tons of water and you're not careful with the system, you can get root rot. And so a lot of these horizontal systems, you have to be really careful about having them exactly level. You gotta be really, or, or making them go downhill so that the water doesn't sit there. And so there's, it's really interesting that you solve that because the water really, with that slope that you had, that water, you know, not, not only do the plants not interfere with one another on either side, but that slope really helps that water get delivered to the root systems in an efficient way. Yeah, I think that that, again, that, would, that just came down to luck that this initial design that we came up with had so many benefits we didn't intend. Right. And I think one of them is what you just said is, uh, you know, the thin film. Uh, so the roots are, are sipping from the stream essentially, but then the whole rest of these pipes, you know, 90% of this pipe is air, which a lot of people don't realize, you know, roots, uh, root systems need a ton of oxygen. Um, so yeah, I think it just came back to, you know, we started simple and, uh, it, with a lot of the other hydroponic systems, <clears throat> you get drippers, sprayers, float valves, siphon valves. Uh, it gets really intricate, really, really quick, but that also means it becomes hard to maintain. Uh, so we just have one pump, no drippers or no drip lines, no sprayers. One twenty dollar no pump from Harbor Freight Tools. I mean, it's just it, not even an expensive one. You have yeah. a backup one. You can afford to have a backup one. If it goes out, boom, you just pop it in. We're not talking about high tech stuff here. It's 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 really amazing. I've never taken a measurement of my water pH or anything like that. I just put nutrients in it and harvest vegetables. It's just incredible that you guys made it so simple. And I'm sure there's a lot of things we could do to even better optimize it. But anyway, you were talking about taste and I got, you got sidetracked and I sidetracked us first, first, but I want to put you back on that because I want to sure. say one other point after you talk about the taste, I want to make one other point that Juliana and I had a discussion about. So yeah, continue oh. on your taste. thing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th that was a big thing for us too. Um, uh, w was the taste and nutritional value um, of, of veggies grown hydroponically. Um, but you know, going back to what you said, soil can be unpredictable at times. Uh, and you are really, uh, waiting for bacteria that's in the soil to break down organic content that has carbon on it into these salts that a plant can actually use. Um, so that, I mean, that is kind of part of the fun and, it, uh, you know, we still enjoy growing in soil as well. We're not pro one and anti the other we do both right um uh but yeah i think um you know if you grow with our system and and put the exact same plant in the soil next to it uh you'd have a hard time telling the difference between uh if somebody else picked it you'd have a hard time telling uh telling the difference uh, of which vegetable or which herb was grown in soil and which one was grown on. But you system. would, you would, if you put a camera on them in terms of time until it fruits and time into there. Yeah. So what did you guys see about that? Oh yeah. So there's, I'm glad you brought that up. So two other unintentional benefits that we just kind of ran into after we chose hydroponics was the growth or the growth rate was, which 
was much quicker because plants were constantly being fed 24 mm-hmm. seven. Uh, so instead of, you know, waiting for, uh, somebody to come out and water them once every two or three days, this is literally 24 seven. It's getting all the air it needs, all the water it needs, uh, and all the nutrients it needs. Um, so yeah, the, the growth rate is really, really fun to watch. Um, you know, sometimes it could be 30% quicker, uh, than, than doing traditional soil. Um, and then the, the other benefit was, uh, saving water. Mm-hmm. Um, so our system saves about 80% of the water compared to doing soil it's because nothing's running off into the ground and nothing's evaporating in the middle of the day. Um, so two other, you know, huge benefits, huge, uh, going incredible with sustainability, yeah. especially in California where we're having right. all of those problems. Yeah. It's droughts yeah. nonstop. I mean, it's, it's so efficient. Yeah. And being so close to the ocean, uh, in Carlsbad, uh, where, 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 where Mike and I are both from, um, you know, runoff into the ocean is also a big thing. Um, right. If nobody's familiar with the salt and sea that's listening right now, it's been decimated and it's in Southern California inland, but it's been decimated because of the runoff from uh, farmland all around the salt and sea and all the nutrients that washed into it created these massive algae plumes and have killed the fish. And it's, it, it really is Mad Max at the salt and sea. So, you know, people don't think about the, the runoff from soil agriculture into uh, water tables and into surrounding uh, bodies of water. Yeah, it's really crazy. You know, it's 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 amazing how much more efficient it is, and the fact that back to the square footage, you have it in a smaller footprint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know we're getting sidetracked with all these benefits. Yeah. I, there's, but there's so many, and there's. It's yeah. so funny that there's kind of this. I don't know when I when I talk about it to audiences, I feel like there's kind of this pushback of oh, like the whole what we were saying before, it's not natural, it's artificial, it's artificial, it's chemicals, and if you think about it from if you're looking at sustainability or if you're looking at you know effic- efficacy and efficiency and like and what you get from it nutritionally, I mean it's just there's nothing negative, there's nothing not amazing about utilizing this type of technology. Yeah, and yeah even think- nutrition. Yeah. yeah, the nut- the nutrition. And that's a surprise. To it, talk it was about that, it was surprising to me because you know I was told, oh no, it has to be grown in the soil, and the soil has to be perfect, and all the stuff that people are so concerned about, and has to be organically grown. That's a big thing too. But but the research does not support that. I mean, the when you when you look at the research on the hydroponically grown produce, it's either the same or better, better. in terms of nutritional uh-huh. adequacy. Yeah, one of the things I was really surprised, there's a study out there that is on tomatoes and cucumbers. And what was really interesting is that, you know, there were several, when they looked at how were the nutrients uptake from the solution, um, what's really interesting about it is that, you know, there were things like, for example, the nitrogen, the potassium were basically correlated with solar radiation and air temperature. You know, so it was that which was driving that. And then phosphorus was actually correlated with root temperature. And then calcium and potassium were were also, um, their content in, in the tomatoes and, and other things were actually associated with the humidity. And so what was really interesting is the plant was responding to its environment and was uptaking nutrients out of the solution in proportion to some of these other things which which sort of supports the idea that you're giving it a, that the limiting rate is not the nutrition, is not the nutrients or minerals that are available, but rather what the other growing conditions are. And I don't know if, you know, if you've seen this in terms of deploying uh, vertical earth gardens in various environments or various places, but but what it looks like is that the limiting issue isn't really the nutrition in the solution, but rather some of these other variables that 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 are available for other plants. But at that point in time, when those increase, you know, needs are increase uptake are they may or may not be available in the soil systems. Yeah, I yeah, mean, clearly exactly we can right. grow. We're none of us are belittling soil. So clearly we can grow vegetables in soil. We're not saying that. What I'm trying to say is I'm trying to make a reasonable comparison between soil and this because it is it is infinitely less complex to do it 
hydroponically. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I, I think, too, it helps get people uh, more comfortable with growing at home because it, it is so much easier, uh, at least in our experience and people who have grown using our garden have said, I've killed everything. I've tried planting and soil because yeah. there are more variables, <laughs> right? There's more yes. variables <laughs> and it's easier for pests to get to. So this is really making it uh, more accessible to people. Um, totally user so, friendly. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's a big, a big part of it too, is just getting, getting people, uh, uh, more comfortable with growing at home and, and kind of lowering that barrier to entry. You know, you don't need to, uh, to have a degree in, in horticulture, uh, biology, uh, and, and, you know, know exactly what soil and, uh, what additives to put in it. And, uh, yeah, it, it's a lot more straightforward. Yeah. And, you know, I grew up on a produce farm. I think I've mentioned this before in the podcast, but I grew up on a produce farm. And so my whole life was out, you know, picking vegetables and, you know, we would actually did a lot of manual control of things like, you know, tomato worms and, and bugs, and we would pick everything off. You know, all of us kids had that job to go out on acres of fields and pick stuff off growing up. But, What's really interesting about this one is that, you know, for the most part, I'm able to just plop everything in. I mean, I did all of my planning yesterday, so I actually set up my vertical earth garden. So if you you go out to, if you go to Instagram, I'll make sure that there's some more pictures of that and we'll get some progress pictures. But it took me, what, an hour and a half or so. I don't know, but you were so blissful out there. <laughs> yeah, I love <laughs> you it. Were having so but much you know fun. what? So, so you know, this year I didn't pull everything out. I just cut everything down when it got to be winter, and I drained the water for the system, Mark. So I, all I had to do was pull them out, uh, pull out what I had there, and I went and you know went to Home Depot and Lowe's uh, and got kale plants and uh, um, butter crunch and uh, a, you know a shard and a couple of other things and. You know, just planted them, and and so why don't you describe how you plant plants in general? What's different about the substrate, or what are the various things? And a little, you know, let's just sort of mentally walk people through what the process is by which you set up something like this. Yeah, yeah, good question. Glad to hear uh, that that you replanted yours uh, for the season. Um, this goes back to when I was talking about Thanks, uh, growing veggies uh, using hydroponics and and really getting like kind of the tribal knowledge of going into hydroponic you stores. And uh, people were asking us, you know, um, because we were showing them pictures on our cell phone of, of what we had designed and were running, and they they all said, "Oh, like." that's not going to work. If you just put starter plants in from a nursery, it has soil all over the roots and you can't have soil and hydroponics, like not even a little bit. It's not going to be, it's not going to work. It's going to clog. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so we labored uh, and really, uh, you know, kind of stupidly, uh, uh, trusted them initially. And you know, this seems to be a recurring theme with you guys is that you were off innovating only because you didn't know you couldn't do it. And, and that's the theme, yeah. by the way, of innovation. We had Peter Diamandis on here a few weeks ago. And, you know, one of the things is, you know, not knowing you can't do something, you know, um, is actually a really good advantage because if you think you can't, you can't. Right. So it was exactly. really interesting that you ran into this so much. A, a lot. Yeah. Um, so we were, you know, washing all the soil off the roots and then planting, um, uh, planting these, uh, starter plants from a nursery, you know, like Lowe's or Home Depot and using like cocoa fiber, uh, initially. And talk talk oh, about yeah, what that is. That's right. It's yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just like inert. So it, it's really just kind of like a neutral substrate for, to hold the plant in place. Uh, it doesn't really affect the, the pH of the water all that much. There's no nutrition in it. It's just kind of like a substrate. Neutral. Yeah. 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 yeah and so this is the fiber from coconuts. And so it's like a husk and they pr compress it under a lot of pressure into a really small brick. And then you piece to take a chunk of this and put it in water and it expands. I don't know how many times, like eight or 10 times. And it just becomes kind of like soil, kind of like stringy soil, but you know, it's not dirty. So it doesn't like, it doesn't get on everything. You know, you can pull it up in a really good clump. And so the 
the baskets that they use are what similar to the baskets that are used for orchids. They're they're net and they have just gaps all the way around. So it's like a a planting pot. It's about I don't know three or four inches in diameter. How big how big are the ones you use? Yeah, they're three and a half. Right. So so in there you have some of this this core material, this coconut, and then you can you know plant like he was describing. You can put get rid of the soil and just use the roots and the plant. Or you can do what I just did, which is I just you know put a little bit of that coconut core at the bottom, and then I you know trim off some of the excess stuff because usually those um, plants are pretty root bound when you buy them at at Home Depot or Lowe's, you know. So I air them out a little bit, stuff it in the middle, and then put a little bit more of that stuff on the top just to you know support the plant everywhere. And then the roots just grow like crazy. I mean, you they grow out of the basket, they grow down the pipe. I mean, sometimes these roots can be like two or three feet long. Yeah. Yeah. So, so initially, right. We were washing off all the soil and like packing them perfectly with this coconut fiber. And you know, <laughs> that's what we had heard from hydroponics, uh, people that had been doing it for years. And, um, you know, I, I think just out of like, you know, we had to, we had to do some stuff quick one time and we didn't have time to like baby off all the soil and put it perfectly in the basket and pack it with this cocoa fiber you know it's way more steps but that's what people said we had to do it was the only way it was going to work and i think just out of like uh yeah just the necessity to make things quicker let's just Um, say it we're we're all lazy right (laughs) yeah yeah i know that's why i changed in doing Uh, this you know we just put the plants directly in from the starter plants we didn't wash off any of the soil and the ones that we had fit the baskets and we kind of just packed them down with a little more soil and uh i think we had forgot about them and came back like a week later to this restaurant and it was exactly the same as the cocoa ones that we had like labored over and we're like oh man like uh, why are we why were we spending all this extra time right and getting the same exact results nothing has changed right um you know both both plants are doing amazing so yeah. from that point on, onward we said screw it you know we're just going to use the plants from the nursery with the soil in it and you know to this day i don't know anybody else in the hydroponics community who kind of does this hybrid now of soil right. plus hydroponics um, and, and it's not a lot of soil, right? It's like a little bit that the plant comes in, when right? You're packing the pipes full. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was blissful ignorance. What's really interesting about the same thing, especially as it applies to me, is that originally, um, Mark and Mike would send out plants. So my first couple of, um, veggies that I had and then I planted them, um, they sent in a box and, in, in just U S postage, they sent all the plants wrapped up, you know, carefully in wet napkins and I, and they were labeled and I unwrapped each one of them and did this process that he's talking about. And then at some point I went to, to buy some locally because it was just a shipping thing and a timing. I was, you know, late at getting something started and I called Mark sort of in a panic, like, what do I do about all this dirt? He said, like, ignore it, Ray. We found that it doesn't really even make a difference. And I thought, really? Cause in my mind, in the way you used to ship everything and it would have a little, the little sponge. If anybody's ever seen a starter block uh, that you buy, you can see them at Home Depot, but basically it's a, it's a tray with, I don't know, I don't know, 50 or 60, 50 or 60 holes in it. And each one has a small piece of foam. And so you put the seeds in there and you keep it moist. You usually heat it to germinate it faster, you know, and then you grow it to a certain point. So you can imagine these little foam blocks with plants. And then you put that inside the coconut core and then the whole thing grows. Well, Mark saved me all this time because now all I would do is pop them out of the pot, you know, just take a little bit of the stuff around the outside off, the loose stuff off. And then I would, you know, like I just described earlier, put a little bit of the coconut core on the bottom. Um, and we'll talk about the wick in a second. And then, you know, replant it like this. And it did just fine. And in fact, if you think about it, in that soil, is a little bit of nutrients that the plant would have been growing in while it was sitting there at Home Depot and Lowe. Yet Lowe's, yeah, it's not a lot. You can't grow it forever in there, but you can grow it for a while. So what was kind of nice about this is, you know, as long as the hydroponic system has nutrients, it has water, it's getting watered at the right amount, 
you know, the plant just has to reestablish its roots and it takes a while for those roots to grow down to the solution. So talk a little bit about the wicks and how that all came about and why that's important. Yeah. Yeah. So, so imagine the baskets, uh, that you put your starter plant in from Home Depot. Um, there's, uh, these baskets hang in these pipes, um, uh, just because they're a little bit smaller than the hole that, that you cut out. Um, so water is flowing underneath, uh, uh, underneath the bottom of, of the pot. So, you know, how, how does the water reach the, the pot and the roots? So, uh, you know, uh, another thing, oh, that uh, other hydroponics people told us was, oh, you got to get drip lines. And, and so the water drips into each basket and then drips down into the pipe. And we said, there's no way we're doing that. So uh, I remember a science experiment from when I was a kid about water tension. And so I I'm just told Mike, this. I'm I mean, like, hey, let's get some live, cotton so rags to start. Up. And just, I just want to let you, you know, know like a live. wick, like a tiki you. torch wick that, that almost like uh, wicks up, uh, you know, the uh, the plant, whatever lighter fluid or whatever goes in them, uh, same exact idea. And sure enough, it worked. And so it just, these wicks were hanging down into the water, wicked up the water and the nutrients to the pot. And then eventually the roots grew down into it. So simple solution. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it really just kind of ended up working out in our favor. Yeah, it's, it's really neat. And so, you know, so now we, Imagine to everybody, we've got um, our plants that we've put in these small containers. We have, uh, we're adding some solution and it's just a, you know, it's just one of these things, X many tablespoons per gallon of the various nutrient solutions. And don't, you don't probably need to go into too much detail there. Um, and then obviously this pump starts pumping this water. What does maintenance on a system like this look like in terms of, of how often one needs to add water, you know, just over the life of the system from the very first planning it all the way through, uh, through the, you know, time to start taking out some plants and putting new ones in. Yeah. Yeah. So say you've already built your, your veg, which, you know, the, the average person can do in a weekend and then a trip to, uh, Home Depot or Lowe's. So you have your garden set up, you fill up this 30 gallon tote with a hose and then probably planting your plants takes 20, 30 minutes initially. And, uh, you plug in your pump, put your nutrients in and it's, uh, everything's growing and working. Um, you know, you probably want to check on it, uh, the first couple days and make sure those wicks are, are in the water. Um, but really you just fill it up, fill up that tote with water and nutrients once a week and uh look for bugs that's really <laughs> all we did ever like at our restaurants that we had them at we would only come once a week um so you know whatever happened in those seven days happened and uh it was always fun to come back and see everything you know twice as big as it was the week before i'm going to tell you what happens here is juliana goes out with her scissors and her big salad bowl bigger than her head so happy it's like my happy place <laughs> it's like oh what do i want here it's so much fun I and mean, if, and it yeah. tastes so good i mean it just tastes so fr like you say i love the word hyper local produce like you literally are going right in the back like one second away and yeah. boom right on the plate that, that was a brainstorming session mark and i had wasn't it mark you know we were trying to say how does this differ the local and, yes. and what was really amazing about this is the vegetables you know not like we'll talk about the range of things you can grow in this unit and then we'll talk about the deep water the veg buddy system but in the range of things that you can grow, yes, you could grow radishes. You can grow a lot of different things in these veggies. But one of the things that I find the most difficult about switching to a plant-based diet is the timing on leafy greens. And what's really interesting is you get the leafy green. It's already been out of the ground for however long before it hits the grocery store. You know, they've got it. They're saturating it with water. Then you get it home. And then, you know, it's in the crisper. And before you know it, it's wilted and, and looks like crap. And yet leafy greens, shard and kales, all kinds of kales and arugula and even lettuce to a degree, you know, not maybe iceberg, but, but these kinds of leafy greens or mixed varieties, you know. 
these things grow like weeds in this thing. So you can go out there and cut, 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 and you think you've just given this thing a haircut, and then there's these tiny little new leaves in the center, and before you know it, you know, if you, I, really, I can harvest from plant to my first leaves come off from this one. I In two weeks, certainly in 18 days, I know for sure, but in two weeks, I will be able to take some kale leaves off of these plants. I have enough of them out there that I will be able to have fresh kale on a salad in two weeks. Okay. So, and, and that's not a stretch, but what this really back to this discussion, Mark and I were having about this idea of hyper local produce is this is exactly the kinds of greens you need to eat in more volume. It's also what's kind of a pain in the butt about shopping for a plant-based diet, because if you don't eat them, they go bad. And what's really great, if you don't eat them, they just stay happy and stay green out in your backyard. You know, it's, it's, it's really the stuff that you really need to eat more of, but it's just difficult to distribute. And so Mark and I were talking about this, about local produce. Everybody was going on and on about local produce. So we, we said, you know, this is, if that's local, you know, produce, ours is hyper local produce. It's in your backyard, you know? It was, a, it was kind that. of a fun thing. <laughs> it's really, it's so good. It's so visceral. And who doesn't want that? Yeah. <laughs> as soon yeah. as you, by the way, from a dietitian's perspective, I have to throw this out there. As soon as you cut it off the, as soon as it's harvested, that's when the nutrition starts to kind of decline. I mean, slowly, but you know, that's what people are concerned about. And that's why they're saying you need to buy organic because organic is going to have, you know, more nutrition. And that's kind of the thinking of it. But basically, you know, anytime it's harvested and then it has to get from the farm to the market or the store, or wherever you're going to buy it. And it's at the store and then it sits on the, in the back and then it has to be put on the shelf and then it sits on the the shelf until you find it and then you get it and you bring it home and it sits in your shelf or your fridge until you eat it. So there's all this time that goes by as the nutrients are slowly, slowly kind of denigrating. But here, hyper local, pick it and eat it. And it's like all the nutrients are intact. So it's kind of like a nutritional, you know, party. <laughs> it's just an yeah. explosion. It's like the, the most ideal way to get your, your nutrients. Yeah. Yeah, Michael D Gudeau always jokes he wants to have a nationwide two-week boycott on buying tomatoes. And his his um his uh, argument is is the tomatoes that he buys in the in the uh, store are always two weeks from being ripe. They have to you have to wait yeah. for them to ripe. So he said if yeah. everybody would just boycott tomatoes for two weeks, we could all go buy ripe tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so true. But you know, this or you could just your, plant your own veg. <laughs> right, and this gets back to your situation. I know you know you ha even had this video on your your YouTube channel of you cutting into this tomato and eating it, and it really is great. I mean, anyone who's picked and and this is whether you do it in a backyard container or, or in a, in a, in a, a soil traditional way, you know, eating a tomato that's warm and ripe right off the vine just tastes better. And, and it's usually, you can buy better varieties. You know, they may not be as appetizing in terms of looking at some of the ones, although now, you know, ugly tomatoes are back in for a while. You couldn't yeah, sell them, right? Produce, but now right. ugly produce is back it's a in. It's thing. It's like trendy. Right. right. It's but, smart. What a great idea. Right. But this heirloom, you know, you can buy some really amazing seeds and you can, you, you don't have to start with a plant. You can just actually start with seeds right in the veg. Isn't that, isn't that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So the two ways to, to grow, right. We talked about, you know, if you kind of want to jumpstart and just go to Home Depot or your local nursery and get starter plants, perfect they grow they grow amazing uh in our system or you know sometimes i even still grow from seed uh johnny seeds is one of our favorites uh u.s companies up in maine uh some of the best seeds that we've ever had in terms of variety and uh success and growth rate and taste um uh yeah so you you just take those uh, net cups that we're talking about that are uh, integral to, to the veg and you can just use soil, put soil, and then just kind of plop your seeds in. And uh, yeah, they'll grow right in the veg. Pretty simple. That's really great. So, so let's describe the alternate system that you guys came up with. You had a Kickstarter. I know I supported you guys on that. And talk about, let's talk a little bit about the Veg Buddy. And it's sort of an alternate version of deep water culture. And then, and, and then we'll circle back because I also then want to talk about all the great things that you have grown in the past because you have so much more experience and you've, done, you've grown so many di more different varieties of things and worked with clients uh, that have grown you know, 
different varieties. I want to hear about that. But let's talk first about the Veg Buddy, where that came from, and and describe yeah. that to everybody. Yeah. So this was uh, this was Mike and I had moved to apartments in San Diego, and we had these tiny little patios and balconies where we couldn't have our you know a bigger veg at at our, each of our apartments. Um, so we wanted to grow at home, uh, but we, we couldn't have these big, big gardens on our patios. So we said, okay, like, what can we do? There's no outlets here. We don't want to do traditional soil. Um, that kind of seems like a headache and we're, we're lazy. Once we get home, we need something real, real simple, uh, real lazy. We didn't have to water at all. So we came up with the veg buddy. So um, so really it's, uh, a combination of hydroponics. Uh, it, it's like the laziest way you can do hydroponics, um, and still have soil and still get all the benefits of, of really nutrient dense produce. Um, so yeah, I'll do my best to describe it. Imagine an orange home Depot bucket. Uh, you put a hole, uh, with a drill halfway up, up the bucket, and then you have this big lid and, uh, in this lid is a basket that hangs down and that basket has all the soil and holds your plant roots and your plant. And again, you just put a cotton wick and it wicks up the water and the nutrients from the bottom of the bucket, uh, to the plant. Um, so that was really just us being incredibly lazy once we got home and <laughs> having like the perfect apartment gardens, um, so yeah, again, blissful ignorance. Uh, <laughs> you didn't know you couldn't yeah. do it. And then, so I yeah, remember, exactly. I remember very specifically this call and you're like, Ray, you won't believe, cause you know, as, and, as most people can imagine, you know, I love to geek out on this stuff. And so Mark would call up and ask about stuff. I'd be calling him, but I just remember when you said, you won't believe I just did this video and we took a normal soil, you know, container tomato and we took the veg buddy and we just time lapsed it for 30 days and we measured how much water it used and we also did the growth and he said you're you're not going to believe this i'm going to put this up but you're not going to believe the difference in how this thing does so tell everybody about the results of that and and how that worked out yeah i want to say i did a side by side video time lapse of tomatoes maybe? yes it was, oh, it was I, tomatoes I have to go back on youtube it was tomatoes look. Yes. Yeah, it was over the course of a couple of weeks, but you could see how much quicker and how much taller uh, the tomato in our veg buddies was growing compared to the soil one. And we were even giving, we used like really premium soil and uh, some like mycorrhiza boosts mm -hmm. in it too. Like we gave soil a fighting chance. Like we gave it more attention than the veg buddy, like watered it regularly and uh it still just didn't catch up in terms of the growth compared to the veg buddy and we had to baby it the whole time too whereas the veg buddy we just planted it once and left it yeah it seems like it was like you watered the veg buddy twice and then you read what in yeah. 30 days and the other one you watered it like 14 times yeah i think it was about every other day right. um so so yeah it was pretty wild to compare and we even had like the soil one up a little higher in the video um uh yeah and it's <laughs> by the end of it it still wasn't as tall and as yeah. big uh as the veg buddy one yeah so this is an alternate uh, if someone's just uh dipping their toe into hydroponics this is kind of a, a simple i think they're called deep water cultures but basically what happens in this case is that with the hole that he's talking about drilling in the bucket, the water, it, when the rain hits the top of the plant and the dirt, the soil, it goes in there and obviously drains through down to the bucket. And since you don't want to drown the, the um, when Mark said that air is so important around the roots, which normally happens by your soil draining well, if anybody's again planted, you know, plants in Alabama, you, you have this, this, you know, clay that's not, draining well and everything ends up dying. So you, you want the water is going to drain through the plant, through the net basket, into the bucket. And when it reaches a certain level, it hits that hole and then it overflows out uh, into the, um, you know, in, uh, you know, onto the pavement. So now you have, you know, you're keeping a good airflow around this, but the roots will send some roots down, which is the plant is perfectly happy with having underwater, but then other ones 
look like and just look sort of like fuzzy you know pillows all around you know where they're they're just all you know the whole thing is just full of roots you know they're just beautiful white bright roots and you can tell that it's healthy uh, I'll say for you if you're in the south or you're any place where mosquitoes grow the other two things I would um, I would say is using the little mosquito dunks which is a bacteria it's not poison it's a bacteria and it's harmless with us if you use the p- mosquito dunks that will kill all the larva and you won't have to worry about it being a mosquito um a mosquito factory <laughs> in your backyard I use mos- I use the dunks actually in my veg hub too so I do both of them I put a one mosquito dunk and that's it and I've done experiments where I've let them form because in Alabama obviously we mosquito is our national bird or is our state bird and so you know we have tons of them here and and I and I've let the larva build up and then put a dunk in and boom they're gone within three or four days they're just all all gone so it works really well but anyway back to this the the vet the the hub I mean sorry the veg buddy you know, this is a way to sort of get started and, you know, it's a bucket. Do you guys still do the the the, the tops or at this point or are, are you we, sending people to places or how are you doing that? We, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, so we don't sell those any longer on our website uh, just because, yeah, we were doing too many things. Uh, it was a lot to keep up with. Right. Aside, Side note behind this whole conversation, Mike and I were working full-time jobs while we were starting this as well. Uh, so that was uh, more or less, we had to kind of consolidate what we were focusing on. Yes. Um, but they're very, very easy to create, super cheap. Uh, you can do them with Home Depot buckets and, and paint them. Uh, we have these really cool wraps that we had a local person sewing to make them aesthetically pleasing. But you can... Um, uh, if you Google search crack D with a K, that's, uh, I believe an acronym for deep water culture. And there's a ton of how to videos on how to make your own, um, uh, and, and the lids I believe are available online. Uh, if you type in five gallon bucket lid, uh, yeah, Amazon, I think the has ones. them for sure. So yeah, yeah. Let's kind of change subjects here just a little bit and you know as we sort of get to the end of this thing i want to really talk about some of the various installations you've done besides the restaurants but also some of the wide range of things that you've grown uh, in both of these and which ones maybe you think are better suited for some over the others what kind of plants are better suited for some over the others. Can you talk a little bit about that so that people can get an idea of what they can do? Yeah. So again, going back to going to these hydroponic stores when we were first starting, you know, after we proved them wrong or, you know, we'd come back in with photos, right. And, and show people and they're like, Oh, I guess it worked. Um, so then we got, you know, people saying, oh, you know, roots for tomatoes are going to be way too big for that thing. And sure enough, we grew tomatoes, uh, you know, huge heirloom tomatoes came back, showed them photos and they were like, oh, I, I, guess, I guess that works. How did you support and, the tomatoes? So oh, yeah, yeah, the tomatoes, it, again, the, the, the structure just happened to be, it lend itself, you know, the initial design to, you know, you could weave the tomatoes in and out of the pipes um, but also, uh, we, we, uh, we would kind of string them up, um, and, and make like a tomato web in, inside of this garden. Um, and, uh, that's kind of how we supported them or our preferred method. Would you plant them on the lower rungs then? Yeah. 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 So we would plant them lower on the garden because they would grow so high and so tall that, uh, we needed to use the top part of the garden. It's kind of like their support. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one of the strategies, uh, that we use when we do bigger plants is, you know, plant them lower and use, use the, the garden structure and the, and the other pipes as a support network for them. Yeah. It, you can get really, really creative, um, uh, in terms of kind of training your plants to grow certain ways or supporting them. Uh, we had people send us pictures of all these cool different ways, uh, that they would support a lot of their plants, like their uh, snap peas or their tomatoes or cucumbers, squash. Um, this kind of goes back to your initial question of what you can grow. 
And uh, we had people send wow. us pictures of pumpkins that they were growing. Um, we did we did five foot tall sunflowers one time for a restaurant. Um, yeah, I mean, it, if it falls in the veggie sphere, you can pretty much grow it in a veg. Um, the only things that uh, are are tricky that right. I wouldn't recommend are are the tubers. So like carrots, potatoes. Uh, yams, anything that grows under uh, right. under the dirt, probably not the best idea. Uh, it, we we trust me, we tried it and and it worked. Although potato buckets, if you Google, yeah, talk if, about if you potato search, buckets. If you search on YouTube, potato buckets are all the rage right now, and people are doing mm. these above ground, you know, even larger installations. But five gallon buckets, people are growing five gallons of potatoes. Now, for me, I put. I, I love to, it would be, I probably should do so it just cool. because of the whole potato thing. But what I usually do is I segregate my, again, you, I, I try to do this a little bit more practically. So things that I can easily buy, like onions or tomatoes or even radishes, because I know you've had some great radishes you grew in there because they're small enough, but, and carrots, you know, those kinds of things, I'll typically, I will go ahead and get those at the store. I also like, you know, I I don't want to hear your input on this with cabbage, but I've also sort of stayed away from cabbage only because cabbage is so inexpensive and so easy to keep in the fr- refrigerator that I would rather actually just buy that, you know, I'll, you know, white head or a purple head and, and have that. But, you know, it's really those, all those fine leafy greens, you know, various different kinds of kales, various different kinds of chard, various different kinds of lettuces. Th- those things are the ones that I, I really love. But but you've also done things like cucumbers and and other 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 sorts of vegetables. And have you been able to grow enough so that you really have a good harvest? Yeah, yeah. I I, I don't think growing <laughs> enough is ever the case with our garden. <laughs> if anything, it's it's always been too much. Where people are just like, oh, like I really oh, underestimated great. how much I could grow with your garden. Um, and, and people just scrambling for recipes and giving away veggies to their neighbors and their coworkers. Um, but yeah, I, I think some of my favorites that I've grown, um, I mean, I'm a big fan of hot peppers and spice. Nobody else here uh, is a fan so, of that. Yeah, we did ghost peppers, uh, one season. Yeah. <laughs> ghost peppers, habaneros, um, Caribbean red hots. Jalapeno Serranos. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah. I'm the, you're speaking my language now, Mark. <laughs> so I did that for Juliana last he did, summer. He so did. Ghost, he made me a whole cayenne, bucket of deliciousness. Yeah. It was all spicy. What was it? Habanero. Uh, habanero it was cayenne. Cayennes and ghost. ghost. And I mean, hundreds of peppers. Oh my gosh. I got hundreds of peppers off of one. And I did that in the Veg bu- Buddy. I did that in the bucket system. I think I've sent you pictures of that. I'll put, I'll, I'll make sure that. And what was great is that we had so many, like you can't really eat all of those in one season, but we dehydrated them and then, and made then peppers. you made these powders that are incredible and they're lasting all year. This yeah. is like a year ago now. And and what's really amazing about growing these peppers, and you know, you know this firsthand because you've grown so many with this, is these peppers have an unbelievable fragrance when you're fresh and you dehydrate them fresh and seal them up immediately. So we make fresh um, red pepper flakes because those are made out of cayenne. You just got to actually put them in a plastic bag when you're doing the crush so you don't get the oil over your hand and stick it in your contacts, which, you know, I know oh, straight. been there, done I that. Know, I know really <laughs> bad how, how this, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a walking person. Uh, I guess they say you're never literally you're never completely worthless. You can always serve as a bad example. Well, that was me. So, but the cracked pepper flakes, <laughs> if you're sprinkling them on pizza or on anything, salads, whatever, they are so much more flavorful. They're not just all heat. They have this init- this other depth of flavor that I don't tend to taste when I buy the commercial version. So it's not just as good as it's way better. I do. Did you find this as well? Yeah. Yeah. I think I was talking to you the other week too. And one of my favorite things to grow because I've never had it this spicy or flavorful. I, I, you can't buy arugula that tastes like this. I guarantee <laughs> it. Um, You're right. But I love arugula. I love the spice and it's, 
insane how good it is uh and how you've never eaten arugula like this until you've grown it at home uh i know you're not a big fan no because, okay so, uh, so you have an adverse reaction so but, yeah i'll uh, tell everybody um so i love arugula i love the spiciness i also love mustard greens too and those are another thing that are just so spicy it turns oh, out yeah. though that i real i figured out i actually have a, I guess this goes along with my cilantro gene, but this is something different. It turns out that a percentage of the population has a problem with vomiting after eating, <laughs> after eating arugula. And I love arugula, and I get it in the store, and I've never had the, uh, never had a problem. However, it turned out that. I want, I go out just like, you know, you heard Juliana talking, we go out, I would snip stuff off and I would, I grew this arugula one year. It came in my, my veg kit from you. And I was so excited about it. It was growing. And then I, I ate it. And then 30 minutes later I would get sick. And it was, it was really strange because I thought, okay, is something on my plants out there? So I was like washing stuff. And it turned out that if I just cut that arugula and put it in the refrigerator for a couple of days, like you would normally do in the crisper, you know, just put it in those same green bags that they, you know, that you bring home stuff. That tempered it enough where it tasted like it was. But I love the flavor that you're talking about. So I can absolutely confirm what Mark is saying. The flavor coming right off the plant is unlike anything you've bought in the grocery store. It's really great. I just can't eat it that way, which is really, you know, I, I guess it it's, 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 pun intended, it makes me sick. You can actually have an issue with, with that. So, but, but particularly the arugula and the mustard greens, and I guess it's something to do with whatever it is that makes them spicy. So. Yeah, I think this, this just goes back and proves, you know, an earlier point of, of, you know, kind of the misconception, or at least this was 10 years ago that hydroponic uh, veggies weren't as flavorful and I, I couldn't disagree more. Um, you know, just hearing us talk about how excited we've gotten about <laughs> things that we've tasted off of it. It's like, uh, it, you know, the proof is in the pudding. I'll, I'll let people's taste buds, uh, judge Dictate. for themselves, I agree. but I'm, I'm pretty confident. <laughs> what it's also an anecdotal proof of, even if it is an N1, is what Juliana was saying earlier is that from the time you pick the lettuce or pick the vegetable that the nutrition or the composition of it is constantly changing because it's no longer a growing plant. And the fact that I can't eat that because of that particular phytonutrient, which may have benefits, so it may not, right? But the fact that it starts in one place and then it tempers in the refrigerator for a couple of days, and we're just talking about a couple of days, and then it didn't bother me that's just an, sort of an example of something a that you have this amazing flavor that you can get right off the the plant right off the veg that you wouldn't really experience with arugula you buy that's been sitting who knows how long in containers or getting slimy and moldy everybody's had that you buy it you bring it home it's got moisture in it from how it's been sitting and then within 2 days everything's slimy and disgusting you know and you got to toss the whole thing away well this is just just in time harvesting and we even have an example of something that clearly is changing over time with it for me to be able you know to to have one response with it fresh off the plant and another after it's been in the refrigerator for a couple of days and so what else is changing that's my question you know what and i've always wanted to do those studies down the road this is one of those things that when we have enough research dollars maybe it's another one of those projects we talk about with this in the podcast all the time once we get everything off the ground where we can really do some video and some group projects, you know, wouldn't it be great to test some of the nutritional levels and do what the pot growers have done, you know, create strains of cruci cruciferous vegetables where we hit it at the right time with a pH change, hit it at the right time with a water temperature change, hit it at the right time with the light change and actually produce vegetables that are many more times enhanced. I mean, they're definitely doing it with CBD and THC and all the different variants. So it, it can be done. And a lot of these phytonutrients that Juliana and I are always raving about, these are these are things that plants put out as defenses because they can't run very fast and they can't fight, you know. So they're they're putting out a lot of these things. And David Sinclair's work on xenohormesis, mm -hmm. once these things are produced as a as a response to stress, 
uh, in the environment that that is then communicated to us by us sensing those same kinds of compounds. This is what resveratrol is. And that seems to be one of is. the most effective in terms of chronic disease management and, and avoidance. It's like so powerful. Right, uh, right. Like the, Yeah, those are the most so, powerful so, phytonutrients. So, you know, there is a possibility as we move forward here, it is, a po it is possible that we actually can, you know, create, if you will, you know, ultra healthy or ultra, ultra you know, nutritious, you know, veg vegetables. And I think that our chances of doing it and controlling the variables in hydroponic are a lot better than trying to do it in soil. I mean, it's just, there is so many variables when you're trying to do it in soil. Not that you can't grow great stuff there. And we also always point out that, you know, when all of these tests, all these studies that have been done on the positive benefits of eating more fruits and vegetables in your diet, they're not running out and getting GMO, you know, organic vegetables are, you know, not that those don't have some advantage, but, you know, they're mainly just getting the vegetables they can. So imagine we could go even to the next level. It's better than, better than the organic you're receiving and better than, than, than that because we've actually, you know, gotten it down to a science where you just have a little controller that's varying these things for you and, you know, based on the light or the sun. I mean, it's really interesting of where this could go in the future, um, but when the control, but anyway, so I want to take you back to arugula was something you could grow that didn't. I know I, I wanted these to happen. I wanted this conversation to happen like this, Mark. I know when we first started talking, you're like, well, I don't know what am I going to talk. I said, Mark, you and I can talk about this forever because we, we both are so passionate about it. And, and Juliana, who's never really grown anything, she's now passionate about it because she, you know, she, quite frankly, she's spoiled of being able to go out and just clip, 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 you know, and she's, she, you know, how much kale can you eat off on these? And you know, Mark, how much kale these things can produce. Like, oh, I can, yeah, I can most people eat can't veg. keep up, most people can't keep up, but she can. <laughs> yeah, I'm proud of it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, you know, <laughs> well, I, yeah, just one last point. I mean, I, I think it's wild too that, you know, some of the veggies that chefs or uh, that kind of like the higher end produce uh, stores or grocery stores carry that are, you know, you see that are, are so expensive um, are actually really easy to grow at home and, and grow grow like weeds at home. So, uh, and not only let's expensive, talk about what are some of not those? Not only expensive, but right now unavailable. Right. That's yeah. people are having a hard yeah. time finding things. So, right, to have it right in your backyard uh, yeah. and not have to depend on anyone is extraordinary right now, especially. Yeah. We're, we're going to do a whole show on that. But if you have rice, if you have dry rice, if you have dry beans, you know, if you have some of those things, you have, you know, some spice. I mean, you know, you can grow a lot of greens, which is that yeah. other side of the plate. It's, it's so easy to do. And, and as little time as two weeks. So, if, if I, if we didn't have right now, and this this was being recorded right in the middle of the lock, the, the shutdown, you know, the quarantine. But if we had started two weeks ago with our plants, we would be eating already all of our kale. I mean, it we, we would have plenty of stuff because it's cool weather right now, perfect growing season for the kale and the shard. I mean, it it just grows fast. What else, what else were you going to talk about in terms of what other plants? like arugula that you were surprised that you could grow and and what are the things that you think are growing like weeds that they're really you know they really uh, that you were talking about with the restaurant owners yeah yeah i think um again some of the some of the plants that get really big kind of shocked me like squash uh always shocked me um and you know talk about something that grows like a weed in the system um the, any any type of summer squash um will just absolutely explode um uh, how so do you support one, the base of it when it's that large yeah so so a lot of the squash have these really really uh kind of like stiff leaves and branches that come out and those actually just kind of grow out and and grow uh grow and hold itself up in this pipe structure but sometimes too we would uh, we would use uh, just like a growing net, like a white net, and just kind of drape it over our veg and just give it a little bit more support. But um, you'd be surprised with uh, with the root system and then those uh, those big branches and leaves that come off. I mean, it will support itself um, uh, even with, uh, you know, 10, 12 squash hanging off of it. Wow. 
yeah, but you know, going back to the peppers, that's that's always been my favorite. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, we, you name it, we've we've tried growing it, um, uh, but really, we've had success growing everything. I think one of the coolest ones uh, that we did. Um, I think I mentioned the, the ghost pepper was, was really fun. Um, but eggplant are really fun too. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Japanese eggplant are really cool. Um, and those grow really, really quick as well. Uh, they're just kind of fascinating plants. The, the veggies that are kind of expensive at the store that you pay a lot for, but actually grow like a weed and you can grow at home. They're super easy. Kale, uh, basil. Uh, any of the specialty mints, um, cilantro, uh, heirloom tomatoes, um, it, you know, all of those grow rapidly uh, in in hydroponics at home. Um, so, yeah, th- those are ones people can look forward to growing. Well, this is great. So what I hope to do out of this, um, I actually pulled Mark a little bit out of retirement. <laughs> so I'm going to be yeah. the, I'm going to be instigator for Mark and Mike again in that Mark's actually now up in the, the Bay area working with a startup, another startup company on unrelated to plants. And Mike has had a brand new baby in the last year. So he's got a year old baby. So that's, congratulations. <laughs> yes. My, yeah, so yeah. they have set of plans and these are the original plans I, I used and they have like the larger unit, but they also have this veg hub unit. And so I asked Mark, you know, did he mind throwing up a couple of page sites so that everybody could buy a set of plans and then also links to where some of these more common things are. And so Mark, tell them a little bit about where they can find you and find that what your Instagram is, and what I want to try to do as sort of a first practical community project, Julian and I want to try to promote people who are growing great vegetables. And we'd like to feature just like, you know, people that are making amazing plant-based dishes and stuff out of our health spam cookbook with things that they grew at home and hydroponics. I mean, obviously if you guys out there have a garden too, that's great as well. But it would be fun to start putting that up there and also sharing some of these pictures over on, I know you're not using Instagram every day with your site, but you still have access to it. So how can they find what you have right now? And then um, what do you expect it costs to build everything, et cetera? Give them a sort of a little rundown of that. And then let's uh, figure out what we can, what we can do to sort of kick off a community that's starting to, do this research project that we've all talked about you know, for you and me, we've been talking about it for almost a decade now, you know, it's crazy yeah. to think that that much time has passed, but it's really great. And I just don't want to let your guys vision die. I know that you're involved in all these other things, but we have such an amazing audience out there. And every single year when I post these pictures, I get deluged with where did you get that and how'd you do it? And and I just I, I just want to keep this alive because you, know, you saw, I sent you a bunch of photos of all of my installations and all my gross stuff. So awesome. And it got you excited again because it's easy to it be in did. a startup. You know, we've been there, we are there, you know, and you you sort of you know get into all the details of the stuff that you got to do with a business. And you kind of sometimes forget that bigger passion. And that's what I know about you and Mike is that you guys were just so insanely passionate about what you did. And I think everybody kind of heard that story today with the idea of all the things that you didn't know you couldn't do that you pulled off and you really launched an entire revolution on online. There's so many people that are, even though it's patented, there's so many people that are doing their own R and D rip off and duplicate. (laughs) We've had a few people like that involved in our business too. The idea here is, is that I just want to, get you to tell them where they can find that and then a little bit about what it takes to to set one up totally yeah and thanks for uh thanks for you know uh getting us kind of kind of back into it you know like i said or like you mentioned mike had a kid i moved up to the bay area so the last couple years have been uh you know just life kind of taking over and uh so we we kind of put veg on, on pause for a bit. Um, so this is a nice way to, to get back into it. You know, Mike still grows at home. I still grow up here. Um, so yeah, this is a great way to kind of get that fire burning again. 
Um, Ray, Ray mentioned, uh, we do, we do have our plans, uh, up on online. I think they're $29 and it's a digital download, a PDF to build, uh, I believe a 16 plants veg at home. Uh, the, the URL is veggie tower garden.com. Um, so yeah, I just got that up last week. Um, so, uh, that should be pretty easy to find and navigate. You can always contact me if you have any issues or, or can't access the website for whatever reason. Um, and then Instagram, uh, we'll get back into it as well. Uh, but it's grow some veggies, um, is, is our Instagram. Um, so and I'll make uh, sure I tag you with the yeah, science and yeah, sorcery link to that. So they'll also have it there too. But to build a, you know, to build the veg, so you download the plants, um, I, I'd set aside a weekend for it, a Saturday and Sunday. You know, you're going to need a trip to, to Home Depot to get, uh, I'd say, 90% of, of what you need. And we include a cut sheet, so you can literally hand a sheet to uh, somebody at Home Depot or, or Lowe's or your hardware store and say, I need uh, this, you know, these pieces of wood cut to this length. Uh, and they should be able to do it for you there. And uh, uh, the the 10% of the, the other things you need uh, will include links on, on where to purchase those online. Um, but yeah, it, it takes about a weekend. Uh, you need a drill and, you know, preferably some sort of uh, saw uh, uh, to, to cut some of the stuff. And I might say with that, really the only specialty tool or specialty thing that you're going to need and this will be something you'll be able to use over and over for other veggies down the road is it's what's called a hole saw and it's like a drill bit but it's a it's a giant cutter and one of the things I want to tell everybody right now because you're talking to a guy that I was building a bigger one and I was so frustrated with using the hole saw and Mark (laughs) tell them what the trick is to drilling PVC pipe with this you know what what size hole saw is it uh, I believe it's three, uh, it's, it's three and a half inches. I want to say it's three and a half inches. Right. By the way, you can get this whole saw at any Home Depot. Any Home Depot. Yeah, they're there. Store. Right. And even a Harbor, um, Harbor Freight Tools, you can get an even El Cheapo version. But tell them yeah, the big yeah. se- secret that I never figured out. I've never seen it written down. It if it's out there, I've never heard anyone doing it. <laughs> tell them how yeah. they drill a hole in a pipe. So after thousands of holes that we've drilled uh, to to make gardens for people, uh, yeah, I guess we we never passed along the secret until uh, until recently until telling Ray. Um, <laughs> but you start uh, you start by drilling the hole in reverse on your drill uh, because the teeth on this hole saw uh, are are pretty gritty and they grip. And then they just kind of won't let go. So if you start it in reverse, it kind of gets a nice groove in the PVC, uh, and then you can put it, uh, uh, put your drill into kind of the normal drive. So it would be going clockwise. Um, but yeah, doing counterclockwise or in a reverse to start at actually does it really well. The reverse, and and guys, you have no idea because my son and I were trying to do this and we're trying to hold the drill at a certain angle and trying, and every time you would start, it would jump and the whole thing would, the whole pipe would jump and it was the biggest pain in the butt. And I, he didn't, Mark didn't let up on a secret back then. I would just let you know, guys, that even though we were great friends over all this time when I was doing this, he (laughs) never volunteered the secret reversal, the reverse (laughs) drill technique until we were talking last weekend I was like, you know, the only thing I'm worried about is everybody drawing holes because it's such a pain in the butt. And he goes, well, so there's something we probably didn't ever say because we were doing it ourselves. So you guys have that secret now. And I, I, once he said it, the light bulbs went off and I said, oh my gosh, yeah, of course that works. You know, that I can see exactly how it works. So, you know, you'll be able to use this over and over. And if you build one of the smaller veg hubs in the, the plans for the veg hub, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And so do you think at some point you can also add the older plans that you had for the larger system? Yeah, we actually just had somebody download plans today from our site and ask about the six foot system. So double the size. I think I know who that somebody was. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I had to, 
I had to email uh, Mike today to get those six foot plans because okay. it's been a while. So we dusted them off. Okay. And uh, yeah, if if you download, uh, you know, just the the three foot plan that's on the site, we'll we'll send you the six foot one as two. Oh, fantastic. Or, 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 yeah, so we'll send you both plans uh, for both sizes. Maybe, you can maybe what we both, should do is we do, do, do you have a do you have a some kind of coupon code or something that's on there that we can do so we can track all these people that are are doing it with us because it would be fun to sort of create a community on this. Yes, we should. Yeah. I don't have one set. We'll up right figure. Now, we'll figure something out, and I can put it in the in the yeah, launch for this it in and, a description. Right, it'd be we'll fun. Definitely do it for you guys. So you know, this has been fantastic. Thanks for taking the time. I know it's late for you, and it's no, late. thank you guys both. And and I I just really want to keep this passion alive. What you and Mike did, I'm I, I'm so Thanks. grateful. I can't tell you how much, how many vegetables and how much produce I have eaten off of this this garden this project. I've had other systems that use soil. I've had, you know, planted systems, but this thing is absolutely the has been the easiest one to do. And uh and Juliana and I just love, you know, eating all those fresh vegetables <laughs> all here. She's she's excited Thanks, right I'm now because by the time she gets back Because when I get home I'm gonna get yeah, when I get back here I'm it'll gonna be, get, everything's gonna be, be bloomed. Ready. Yeah, it's like perfect timing. I hope that we can continue to turn this into something and maybe I can do some, you know, Julian and I are ready to start doing some live streams. So right now, you know, awesome. obviously subscribe for people who've been listening to our podcast for a while. It would be great for ha to have you guys go and give reviews. Those things are great for helping us. And then also we have a new YouTube channel, Science and Saucery. We've been uploading our podcast up there, just sort of a still image or a little animated image with uh the podcast and we've we did some test streams to Facebook Live. We did uh, test streams to um, to YouTube, and those are all both working. So we'll probably be doing more of this uh, together. So we'll we'll be doing that. We we've interviewed and have been interviewed by Crocs in the Kitchen. Those guys have just their Brian and Jessica are just so much fun. We're we're having so much fun working with them, and they're really you know starting at eight hundred pounds. They're really just you know killing it in terms of of doing well, their YouTube channel is growing like crazy, and so I think you know this very well might be one of the very the first things I've talked about. So many ideas about doing projects, but this may be one of the first things we can do with sort of a a a revision of what you guys were doing to support your groups. Talk about your the YouTube channel and and real quick what is up there because there there are some guides on building things there are some th things that you guys put together in the past and then the subscription system you have some of the older videos on that too yeah so our youtube channel oh man it's been it's been a while again bear with me it's been been a few years until the last couple of weeks when uh when you got me got me back in to uh to getting involved and it ended up just being a really good time in my life and mike's life um to do this but yes our youtube channel uh, i'm sure you sure you will include a link to it yes um but it it does have uh a lot of how to's one of the main playlists it's kind of a companion to the diy plans uh, so if you get the DIY plans, uh, we'll send you the link to the playlist as well. That's public. Um, and that will kind of give you some of those tips and tricks on on uh, on building your garden over the weekend. Um, some of them are with uh, painting pipes um, if you want it to look really cool. And then we also have a bunch of videos on planting from seed, planting from uh, nursery plants, kind of like we talked about earlier. Um, and then, yeah, some of the seasons, uh, we have playlists that covered whole, whole growing seasons when we were doing deliveries, uh, to San Diego residents. So we're going to keep those up there. Um, they might be Fantastic. a couple years old, but it's, it's cool to see over the course of three months. Um, you can see we did a, a video or two every single week for like three months and you can kind of see the progress yourself if you're kind of unsure about this and, and right. see if it's for you. Yeah, so the, if you just put Vertical Earth Garden in YouTube, you'll get it, and their channel is called Veg, V-E-G, Veg. So it would be really great for us to be able to have that and then also the things that we may do. There's a bunch of DIY. You'll see the DIY um, playlist for building the hub. 
and that's all the things that you kind of need. And obviously the plans just give you all the details, et cetera. And then, you know, give Mike and Mark, you know, their ability, you know, they patented this. So not that they're going to be out suing anybody or doing anything like that. But at the same time, I liked you guys to be able to benefit from all this innovation and work. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to, to have been able to do this and know you guys have watched this whole thing. And I just want to see it take off in a more community way. So for sure, I will stay involved. I'll be posting images on our, mine and Juliana's uh, um, Instagrams, and we'll also pu put stuff on the Science and Saucery and Healthspan Solution. And, you know, just wait to see some of our recipes we're going to do with some of the things that we grow this summer. It should be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm really excited to see where you guys take this, and it's been fun to see your growth as well. Um, you know, over the, over the course of really, like you said, the last decade. That's so great. Yeah. Th thank you so much for having me on. Uh, All right. Both thank you, you so and, much, Mark. Thank you yeah, for being with us. It's been awesome. I knew that was going to go long, <laughs> but fascinating. Yeah. It's fun. I hope and inspiring. everybody loved this. Like yes. I really can't wait to do this again. Thank you so much for joining us on this very leafy green path to good health. It's always the food. So remember, keep, keep eating, eating right. right. Thank you for listening to Science and Saucery. For more details about the content in today's show or to contact Juliana and Ray, please visit us at healthspansolution.com. Welcome to the first day of the rest of your life. Should have been much worse. Welcome to the last road on the right of your life.